Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone, I am Dr. Rose, Assistant Professor, Department of Anatomy, Government Medical College, Thrissur. In this session, we will be talking about the topic placenta. So again, before moving on to the topic proper, let us see a clinical condition. This fetus is suffering from a condition known as erythroblastosis fetalis. So what do you mean by this condition, erythroblastosis fetalis? In this condition, there is antibody response by the mother's immune system when the fetal blood vessels reach the maternal circulation crossing the placental barrier. So what happens is usually the fetal blood vessels will not reach the maternal blood, but at times it might get mixed up with the maternal blood crossing the placental barrier. It can be due to some defects in the placental barrier. So, as a result, what happens is the mother's blood will start producing the antibody and that will result in destruction of the fetal red blood cells. So, as a result, what happens is there will be hemolysis of the fetal red blood cells and as a result, there will be increased production of erythroblasts in the fetus. Ultimately, the fetal fetus will result in fetal hydropes that is the body will be fully edematous. In this condition what we usually do is we administer RH immunoglobulins in order to counter this reaction. So this condition is known as erythroblastosis fetalis. So in order to understand why this mechanism happens you need to know what are the events occurring at the placental barrier or how a placental barrier is formed uh, in course of time. So in this session we will be dealing with the placenta, the topic placenta, how this placenta is formed, what is the structure of the placenta, what is the function of the placenta and how this placenta is classified based on the structure, based on the development. So uh, let us see what do you mean by placenta. Placenta is considered as a fetal maternal organ. Fetal maternal organ means the structure which connects the fetus with the mother that is why it is known as the fetal maternal organ. So, as the word implies, we know that there will be a fetal part that is a part of the chorionic sac and there will be a maternal part that belongs to the endometrium. So, this is the endometrium. So, this region of the placenta will be the maternal part and this region is actually belonging to the fetal portion and that will be actually a part of the chorionic sac. Now, what are the functions of placenta? Placenta is essential for the protection of the fetus. It is acting as a source of nutrition, it helps in respiration, it helps in excretion of the waste products and it also secretes some of the important hormones. So let us see the structure of placenta first. So during fourth month of intrauterine period, this is how it will look like. This is the fetal portion because to the fetal portion, the easiest way to identify the fetal portion of the placenta is just look at the umbilical cord. So, the surface to which the umbilical cord is attached that is known as the fetal portion of the placenta and this will be covered by the amnion. So, the fetal portion is otherwise known as chorion frondosum and this will be covered by the amnion. What about the maternal portion of the placenta? Maternal portion of the placenta is actually known as the basal plate. So, you have the chorionic plate and the basal plate on either side. So, the chorionic plate will be on the fetal part and the basal plate will be on the maternal part. And in between these two plates, you can see many projections. They are known as the villi. So, the villi will be actually connecting the chorionic plate with the basal plate. And it is through this villi, you have the fetal capillaries traversing and uh, this is how the exchange of uh, things happen between the maternal blood and fetal blood. Since the maternal blood and fetal blood are not directly getting mixed up, 
the fetal capillaries will be traveling through the villi in order to reach this region and it will be actually exchanging with the maternal blood in the intervillous spaces. So, the space between the villi you call it as intervillous space which is filled with maternal blood. So, when you think about placenta you should think about the surface of the placenta facing the fetus, surface of the placenta facing the mother and the structures passing through the placenta. So, once again the structure which is facing the fetus you call it as a chorionic plate which is covered by the amnion. The structure which is related to the mother you call it as basal plate. The structures traversing this placenta from mother to fetus and vice versa that is the villi and uh, the spaces between the villi you call it as intervillous space and this intervillous space will be filled with the maternal blood. So, the, how come the maternal blood reaches the intervillous space? You can see the blood vessels in the endometrium opening into the intervillous space. So, they are the endometrial vessels both arteries and veins. So, they are actually filling up the intervillous spaces with blood. So, uh, now what happens is the decidual tissue which is a part of maternal endometrium will be eroded by the enlarging intervillous space. So, these are the intervillous spaces. You can see the intervillous spaces. These are the villi and you can see the intervillous spaces. So, these intervillous spaces as they move on to the endometrium they will be eroding the endometrial wall. But at times the region of the decidua will remain between the intervillous spaces or between the villi. So, the region which persists is known as placental septa and they will be projecting towards the chorionic plate of the fetus. So, the intervillous space will be moving in this direction eroding the endometrium of the mother and some of the tissue will remain there, some of the decidua will remain there and they are known as the placental septa and they will be actually uh, lying closer to the chorionic plate. So, this is the placental septa. So, the region between two placental septa you call it as the cotyledon. So, this cotyledon you can see from when you look from the maternal surface once the placenta is getting detached from the uterine cavity when you look the maternal side you can see these cotyledons arranged. So, the cotyledon means the distance between or the region lying between the two placental septa. So, when you look from the mother's surface this is how it will be looking like. It won't be seen as a smooth flat surface. They are actually seen as different polygons that is because of the presence of this placental septa. And how many cotyledons you expect on the maternal surface? It is roughly 15 to 30 cotyledons and uh, each cotyledon will be having two or more stem villi and their branching villi. So, when you just uh, cut this one cotyledon as a piece of cake and if you just look into each cotyledon you will be getting two or more stem villus along with their branches in it. Similarly, there is another term which is known as fetal cotyledon. So, what do you mean by fetal cotyledon? The maternal cotyledon is seen from the mother's surface. The fetal cotyledon means if you look if you are going to look from the fetal surface you can see a major stem villus and you can see the blood vessels running through each stem villus. So, each stem villus with the fetal capillaries you call it as fetal cotyledon. So, let us see. So, these are the cotyledons and these cotyledons are actually formed due to the formation of the placental septa. This is one single cotyledon. Okay. This is one single cotyledon and each cotyledon will be having that is each maternal cotyledon will be having two or more stem villus with its uh, associated branching villi. And what do you mean by fetal cotyledon? This is the fetal cotyledon and this you can appreciate from the fetal surface. So, if you just trace one stem villus along with the fetal capillaries in it, one stem villus with the fetal capillaries in it, you call it as the fetal cotyledon. So, these are the two terms which you should know maternal cotyledon and fetal cotyledon. Now, uh, when you look at a placenta at full term placenta what are the features which you can make out? It will be looking like a disc. So, it will be discoid. What about the diameter? It will be roughly 15 to 25 centimeters. The thickness of the placenta will be roughly 3 centimeters. 
and uh, what about the weight of the placenta? It will be roughly half a kg that is 500 to 600 grams. What about the ratio of the placenta to fetus or how big is the placenta? Suppose if you uh, consider a fetus as 7 parts, the placenta is just one part of the 7 parts. So, that is 1 is to 7 is the ratio maintained between the placenta and between the fetus. Between the fetus and placenta the ratio is 1 is to 7. And usually this placenta is expelled 30 minutes after birth of the child. Since it is coming after the birth of the child, this placenta is also known uh, locally as the after birth. Now let us see each part of the placenta in detail. Uh, we have already mentioned about the chorionic plate which is seen on the fetal side. It was covered by amnion. So what are the structures uh, when you trace this chorionic plate from fetus to mother? The first thing which you will be seeing will be the primary mesoderm with the umbilical vessels. Then you have the cytotrophoblast layer, then you have the syncytial trophoblast layer which are lining the intervillous spaces. So, this is the chorionic plate okay? and this is the chorionic plate on the fetal side. You can see many finger like projections. So, what are the structures? So, if you look from fetus to mother, first you will be seeing the mesoderm then you can see the finger like projections, they are actually the trophoblast. So, which are the structures seen in the finger like projection? You will be getting the cytotrophoblast first, then you will be getting the syncytial trophoblast. So, the syncytial trophoblast will be actually lining the intervillous spaces. So, fetus to mother, this is actually a cut section of the placenta. You can see this is the chorionic plate and this is the basal plate. So, this means this is the fetal side and this is the maternal side. So, if you look from here towards the mother, this is actually the primary mesoderm and you can see the umbilical blood vessels here, okay? the primary mesoderm with the umbilical blood vessels. Then you can see a layer of cell that is known as the cytotrophoblast, one single layer of cell that is the cytotrophoblast and along with that outer to it you can see the syncytial trophoblast. Okay. So, the syncytial trophoblast when you see you can see that it is actually lining the intervillous space. This is one villus, this is another villus, the space between these two villus you call it as intervillous space. So, the syncytial trophoblast will be actually lining the intervillous space. Now, we will see the other side. Just now we discussed about the chorionic plate which is on the fetal part. Now let us see the other surface of the placenta that is the basal plate which belongs to the maternal side. Now if you look from the mother to fetus, what are the structures which you see first? The first thing which will be the decidua basalis with the maternal blood vessels. So decidua basalis is a part of endometrium of mother, endometrium of the uterine cavity. So the decidua basalis will be the first structure which you will be seeing when you are standing on the mother's side of the placenta. And this is actually a part of stratum spongiosum layer of the endometrium. After that, you will be getting the syncytial trophoblast followed by the cytotrophoblast outer shell. Then you will be getting one more layer of syncytial trophoblast that is known as the inner syncytial trophoblast layer. So, usually the umbilical cord is usually central and it can be eccentric or marginal. That is how the attachment of the umbilical cord is described. So, let us see the structure in detail. This is known as the basal plate. So, here you have the decidua basalis. Decidua basalis is the uh, region of the endometrium where the implantation happens. So, when you look from the mother's side, you can see the decidua basalis first. Then you can see the syncytial trophoblast followed by cytotrophoblast outer shell. Then again you will be getting another layer of syncytial trophoblast. So, these are the layers which you will be encountering when you look at the basal plate from mother to fetus. So, this is about the basal plate. Uh, Let us see the different layers one by one. So, this one first one will be the, uh, we will be seeing the different layers. If you look from the mother to fetus, the first one will be the decidua basalis with maternal blood vessels. So, this is the decidua, the endometrial region. You can see many cross sections of the blood vessels. So, decidua basalis with maternal blood vessels in the stratum spongiosum that is one. 
then 2 is marked as the syncytial trophoblast layer, then you have the next layer as cytotrophoblast outer shell. So, the cytotrophoblast outer shell will be forming the third layer followed by the inner cyto, this is the cytotrophoblast outer shell followed by you have the syncytial trophoblast the inner layer. So, these are the four layers which you will be seeing at the basal plate when you look from the mother's side towards the fetal side. So, once again you have the decidua basalis which is a part of endometrium then you have the syncytial trophoblast, then you have the outer cytotrophoblastic shell again followed by the syncytial trophoblast inner layer. Now, what are the changes happening in the endometrium after implantation? That reaction is known as decidual reaction. So, the endometrial cells will get swollen up due to the deposition of the glycogen and lipid in their cytoplasm and such cells are known as decidual cells and they are actually providing nutrition to the early embryo and this said to be actually an immunologically privileged site for the conceptors because usually what happens is uh, if there is any foreign body getting implanted in the body, the body will have a mechanism to expel it but in this case though fetus is a foreign body it should not be expelled. So, this region by the process known as decidual reaction is made into an immunologically privileged site so that the fetus though a foreign body will not be expelled. So, the three layers of endometrium are stratum compactum, stratum spongiosum and stratum basal. So, the stratum compactum and stratum spongiosum is to, uh, they are together known as stratum functional and the third layer is known as stratum basal. So, the first two layers stratum compactum and stratum spongiosum together known as stratum functional and uh, the basal region is known as stratum basal. Now, uh, the decidua the blastocyst after implantation is the uh, blastocyst is actually getting implanted in the stratum compactum layer and it will reach up to the stratum spongiosum the superficial part of the stratum spongiosum. So, the endometrium surrounding the conceptus and the lining the uterine cavity gets differentiated after implantation. So, till before the implantation you call the lining of the and uterine cavity as endometrium, but after implantation the endometrium is renamed according to the site of implantation. So, let us see how the endometrium is renamed. So, the point at which the implantation occurs that region is known as decidua basalis or the embryonic pole of the blastocyst. So, the embryonic pole of blastocyst is the part of the endometrium to which the fetus attaches. So, this is known as decidua basalis. Now, another term is decidua capsularis. Actually, this fetus or the embryo is getting uh, embedded in the endometrium, is not it? So, this fetus will be covered by a layer, layer of endometrium other than the decidua basalis region. So, the part of endometrium covering the entire fetus that is known as decidua capsularis. So, the embryonic pole is a point of attachment where you get the development of placenta whereas, the rest of the fetus will be actually covered by endometrium that is known as decidua capsularis or otherwise known as embryonic pole. Now, uh, the remaining part of the uterine cavity will be still having endometrium and that region is known as decidua parietalis. So, the same endometrium is renamed after implantation. The point of attachment decidua basalis, the remaining part of the fetus covered by decidua capsularis and the remaining endometrial wall will be lined by decidua parietalis. Now, let us see the development of placenta. By around 8 day the blastocyst will be partially embedded in the endometrial stroma. Now, the trophoblast layer is getting differentiated as cytotrophoblast and syncytial trophoblast. These are the two differentiating layers in the trophoblast. So, what do you mean by cytotrophoblast? You can see the cytotrophoblast the innermost layer. Okay. So, this layer is known as the cytotrophoblast. They are nothing but mononucleated pale staining cells with distinct cell membrane. You can see the cell membrane of each cell and they are mitotically active. They are giving rise to uh, different um, future cells which are filling up the syncytial trophoblast region also. So, they are actually mitotically active. 
So, they are mononucleated pale staining cells with distinct cell membrane and they are mitotically active. New cells actually migrate into the superficial layer that is the syncytial trophoblast layer. So, what do you mean by syncytial trophoblast? The word meaning of syncytium is multinucleated. So, syncytial trophoblast means multinucleated without limiting cell membranes. You would not be able to make out the cell membranes of the syncytial trophoblast. And they are said to be rapidly expanding compared to the cytotrophoblast, syncytial trophoblast is said to be rapidly expanding and they are deeply stained compared to the cytotrophoblast. So, let us see uh, this is the single layer of cytotrophoblast, you can see the dark blue colored region, a layer of cells that is this is a dark blue colored region, a layer of cells that is mitotically active that is known as the cytotrophoblast. Syncytial trophoblast is outer to it and they are actually multinucleated mass with no cell boundaries. Now coming to the endometrial cells, they are actually undergoing a process known as apoptosis. Some of the endometrial cells will be undergoing a process known as apoptosis. Now simultaneously what happens is in the syncytial trophoblast you have the lacuna spaces developing. So, when the syncytial trophoblast is having spaces within it, this stage is known as lacunar stage, lacunar stage of the syncytial trophoblast. Later what happens is the endometrial wall will be having endometrial vessels, both endometrial arteries and endometrial veins. So, these blood vessels will be starting to erode the syncytial trophoblast and they will be filling up the lacuna spaces with the maternal blood. So, the endometrial capillaries will just get ruptured and it will be pouring out the maternal blood in order to fill the lacuna spaces. So, the fluid in the lacuna spaces actually passes to the embryonic disc because the placenta uh, it is not fully uh, functional at this moment. So, what happens is the embryonic disc is here, it needs nutrition for this time. So, what happens is the nutrition in the lacuna spaces uh, through the maternal blood will be diffusing into the embryonic disc. Now, this is actually uh, the invading of the lacuna spaces by the maternal blood vessels is actually considered as the first sign of establishment of placental circulation. And as we all already know the oxygenated blood comes through the spiral endometrial arteries and the deoxygenated blood is taken back through the endometrial veins. The maternal blood uh, passes through the trophoblastic system and this sort of circulation is known as placental circulation. The blood from the uterus is actually carried to the placenta. So, that is known as placental circulation. We know that these are the lacuna spaces in the syncytial trophoblast, but the entire syncytial trophoblast is not replaced by the lacuna spaces. So, you get some of the syncytial trophoblast lying between the lacuna spaces and these regions are known as trabeculae. So, what happens to the trabeculae further? So, in the by the end of the first week, uh, you, this is getting implanted, the blastocyst is getting implanted in the uterine endometrium. By the second week what happens is you have the formation of cytotrophoblast and syncytial trophoblast, you have the trabeculae between the lacuna spaces. Now the primary chorionic villi is formed, primary chorionic villi means from the cytotrophoblast you have cellular extensions into this syncytial trophoblast. That is cellular extensions coming from the cytotrophoblast will be invading through the trabeculae and that is known as a primary chorionic villi. So, a primary chorionic villus will be having the cytotrophoblast in the middle covered by the syncytial trophoblast in the outer region. So, these primary chorionic villi will be seen all round the uh, implanted blastocyst and this is actually said to be the first stage in the development of the chorionic villi of the placenta. Now, we have already mentioned that the poorly oxygenated blood is taken up by the endometrial veins and by the end of second week you have the primary chorionic villi uh, formed by the proliferation of the cytotrophoblast as cellular extensions into the uh, 
since ischiotrophoblast. By third week what happens? So, this is the cut section of a primary chorionic villus. So, you can see in the middle this is a section of cytotrophoblast and towards the periphery you have the syncytiotrophoblast. So, if you take a primary villus and if you take a cross section this is how it looks like. By third week what happens is the primary villi with the cytotrophoblastic core will be covered by the syncytiotrophoblast and at this moment the mesodermal cells will be penetrating into this primary villi. By the third week you already have the primary chorionic villi. To the center of this primary chorionic villi you have the mesodermal cells invading or penetrating that is known as secondary villus. So, a secondary villus is formed when the mesodermal cells proliferate and penetrate into the primary chorionic villus. Now, what do you mean by tertiary villus? So, this is the secondary villus you can see this is the primary villus where you in the center you have just the cytotrophoblast. In the secondary villus you can see in the center it is the mesoderm and if this mesoderm is invaded by the fetal capillaries you call it as tertiary villus and this is almost a mature villus. So, these are the stages of development of a chorionic villus. This is primary villus uh, where you get in the center the cytotrophoblast, in the secondary villus you have the mesodermal core. In the tertiary villus you have the fetal capillaries and towards term uh, you can see that the fetal capillaries are moving towards the periphery and some of the cytotrophoblast cells are missing. So, this is how uh, it is becoming a term villus. So, the chorionic villus is actually considered as the functional element of placenta. So, this is the implanted blastocyst. So, in the beginning you can see that the entire uh, blastocyst will be covered by the cytotrophoblast and syncytiotrophoblast and from each uh, cytotrophoblast layer you will get the chorionic villi formed that is the primary chorionic villus surrounded by the maternal bed. So, this is how the chorionic villus will be uh, interacting with the maternal blood. Now, what happens is this will be invaded by the fetal capillaries. The fetal capillaries actually starts uh, from the connecting stalk and that is actually developed from the allantoic diverticulum. Allantoic diverticulum is actually formed in order to vascularize the connecting stalk. So, you can see the fetal capillary is formed and they will be invading into each villus through the mesoderm. So, this is surrounded by the maternal blood and it contains capillaries in which you have the fetal blood circulating. So, uh, the maternal blood and fetal blood they are not in direct contact. You have the maternal blood surrounding the uh, villi, but the fetal capillaries are within the villi. So, they are not coming in direct contact with the maternal and between the maternal and fetal blood. So, this is how a chorionic villi in the initial stages formed. It develops from the surface of the trophoblast along the entire circumference. Now, what happens is the chorionic villi uh, which are arising from the chorion will be now confined to the embryonic pole. So, what happens to the remaining region they will be just degenerating and the chorionic villi will be now confined to the embryonic pole. So, the chorionic villi lying at the embryonic pole is known as chorionic frontosum whereas, the region of the chorion without any villi or the degenerated villi is known as chorion leaf. So, the in beginning you had chorionic villi arising from the entire surface of the chorion, but in course of time what happens is the chorionic villi will be confined to the embryonic pole. So, that region you call it as chorion frontosum and the remaining region you do not have any chorionic villi that will be just degenerating. So, the chorion without any villi in course of development you call it as chorion leaf. So, this chorion frondosum is actually developing as our future placenta. This is chorion frondosum and this region is known as chorion leaf. These two terms you have to keep in mind. So, this villi, what, what, why you want uh, formation of chorionic villi? As you have more and more number of uh, finger like processes, they actually increase the surface area of exchange. Now, let us see according to the structure how this villi is named. 
The first one is anchoring villi. So, you can see that this villus is actually anchoring between the basal plate and chorionic plate. This is actually the first formed villus and this connects the chorionic plate with the basal plate. From this you have many stems, if you consider this as a tree, the main trunk is the anchoring villus and from this you have many branches arising. They are known as stem villus or uh, sorry, the stem villus is the truncus core and from this stem you have many branches arising, they are known as rami core and again this branch is dividing into finer branches, they are known as ramuli core. So, the truncus core is the stem villus, from it you have the major branches which you call it as rami core which is again dividing into finer branches which are known as ramuli core. Now, uh, what do you mean by free or floating villi? So, if, the, if you consider the main stem as the anchoring villus, the branching villi will be actually floating in the intervillus space, on either side of the anchoring villus you have spaces filled with maternal blood. So, these spaces will be actually filled with maternal blood and these villi, the branches will be actually floating in the maternal blood. So, these villi which are floating in the maternal blood are known as free villi or floating villi. Now, let us consider about uh, how this blood from the mother is circulating into the placenta. We know that there are maternal cotyledons and these receive blood through 80 to 100 spiral arteries. So, roughly 80 to 100 spiral arteries are feeding the placenta with the maternal blood into the intervillous spaces. Now, the volume of the intervillous space as when you calculate the entire volume of the intervillous space, it is roughly 140 ml and 500 ml of blood is actually circulating through the intervillous space per minute. So, in one minute 500 ml of mother's blood will be reaching the placenta and coming back. So, roughly it will be circulating 4 times in a minute because the space, the volume of the intervillous space is roughly 140 ml but 500 ml of mother's blood is reaching in 1 minute. So, it should be actually circulating 4 times in a minute uh, per placental circulation. So, the placental membrane or barrier, so what do you mean by placental membrane or barrier? So, this is a barrier which is separating the maternal blood in the intervillous space from the fetal blood within the fetal capillaries. They are not in direct contact with each other. So, there should be some barrier between the maternal blood in the intervillous space when the fetal blood in the fetal capillaries. So, that is what is meant by placental barrier or placental membrane. So, uh, in the initial period up to third month of intrauterine period, it is roughly said to be four layered. So, which are the four layers? Imagine that you are standing inside the fetal capillary and you are looking at the maternal blood in the intervillous space. So, you will be seeing many curtains and you are not able to see the mother's blood in the intervillous space directly. So, which are the curtains? These curtains are actually considered as the placental barriers. So, the first thing which you will be seeing if you are standing inside the fetal capillary will be the endothelial lining of the fetal capillaries itself along with its basement membrane. After that you will be seeing the connective tissue that is the primary mesoderm. Then you will be seeing the basement membrane of the cytotrophoblast along with the cytotrophoblast layer followed by the syncytial trophoblast. So, you can see the fetal capillaries. So, this is a cross section of a tertiary villus. You can see the fetal capillaries in the center. Surrounding the villi, you will be uh, getting the intervillous space filled with maternal blood. So, from inside of the fetal capillary towards the maternal blood, what are the structures? First thing will be you will be seeing the endothelium of fetal capillaries along with the basement membrane. This white colored region is actually the mesoderm. Then you can see the violet colored region that is the basement membrane and cells of the cytotrophoblast followed by the syncytial trophoblast. So, these are the barriers uh, which you will come across when you look from the fetal capillary to the maternal blood and this is actually a term villus. Term villus means the fetal capillaries will shift its position from the center towards the periphery so that 
it will come closer to the maternal blood. So, as it reaches towards the periphery, you can see that the cytotrophoblast cells are missing in this region and it is more closely lying to the syncytial trophoblast so that it is more lying closer to the maternal blood for a better exchange. So, that is what that process is known as maturation of placenta. So, by fourth month, the placental membrane becomes thin as the fetal blood vessels move towards the periphery from the center for a better exchange of nutrients. So, the placental barrier is actually reduced into two layers as the placenta becomes matured. So, which are the two layers which you get? Till now, we mentioned about the four layers, but as the placenta gets matured. How is it getting matured? The fetal capillaries from the center will be moving on to the periphery. So, as it gets matured, the endothelium of the fetal capillaries will be actually uh, seen closer to the maternal blood and uh, the intervening tissue will be the syncytial trophoblast. The cytotrophoblast layers will be moving away. So, if you see the layers from the fetal capillary to the maternal blood, the first thing will be the fetal endothelium, the capillaries will be rest, the endothelium of the fetal capillaries will be resting on its basement membrane. Then you have the syncytial trophoblast, the cytotrophoblast layer is actually missing. Now the syncytium actually fuses with the capillary wall forming vascular syncytial membrane. So, the placental barrier from four layered it is actually becoming two layered and sometimes the fetal endothelium will be fusing with the syncytium forming the vascular syncytial membrane. And the human placenta is said to be hemochorial. Hemochorial means it separates the maternal blood in the intervillous space and the fetal blood. Now, let us discuss something about the umbilical cord. What do you mean by umbilical cord? Umbilical cord is the structure which connects the fetus with the mother. So, it attaches fetus to the placenta and that is how it is maintaining the connection with the mother. So, this is actually derived from the connecting stalk attached to the caudal end of the germ disc. We can see this is the implanted blastocyst, this is the connecting stalk and as the amniotic cavity, this is the amniotic cavity which was very small in the beginning, this continues to expand creating a tube of amniotic membrane around the connecting stalk and the white line duct. So, you can see this is the cavity. This cavity is actually expanding at a faster rate. The small cavity expands at a faster rate and it results in folding of the embryo so that the amnion will now be line covering the umbilical cord as well as the white line duct, the connecting stalk and the white line duct. So, this results in the formation of the umbilical cord. The yolk sac and the white line duct usually disappear after birth. Once its function is over, the yolk sac and the uh, white line duct which connects the yolk sac with the mid gut, all these things will be disappearing after birth. The roughly the length of the umbilical cord is said to be 50 centimeters and the diameter is said to be 2 centimeters. Let us see if you take a cross section of the umbilical cord, what are the structures or what are the contents which you get within the umbilical cord. The first one is Wharton's jelly. So, this is actually a histological view, microscopic view of the umbilical cord. So, you can see the cut sections of the umbilical vessels along with a mucoid connective tissue. So, the Wharton's jelly is nothing but mucoid connective tissue which are primary mesodermal cells and they are rich in mucopolysaccharides especially the hyaluronic acid, then the fibroblast and macrophages. It is actually uh, protecting the umbilical blood vessels. The next content of the umbilical cord and the most important one is the umbilical artery. So, the umbilical arteries are two in number and uh, they are actually derived from the internal iliac artery, the ventral division of the internal iliac artery. And though it is known as umbilical artery, they are carrying deoxygenated blood from the fetus to the mother. That point you have to keep in mind. And after birth, what happens is the proximal part of the umbilical artery will be getting transformed as a superior vesicle artery supplying the bladder, and the distal part will be just obliterating since there is no more function for that distal part. 
and that is known as medial umbilical ligament. So, the umbilical artery, the remnant of it will be seen in adults as the medial umbilical ligament. Now, coming to the next content, so these are the two umbilical arteries, so they are two in number. Now, coming to the umbilical vein, so umbilical vein in the initial period, again there were two umbilical veins, but one gets degenerated and the vein which is left behind is the left umbilical vein. You can remember it like that, the vein which is left behind is the left umbilical vein. Again, though it is called as a vein, it is carrying oxygenated blood from the placenta to the fetus, that is from the mother's side to the fetus, the oxygenated blood is carried by a vein and that vein is known as umbilical vein. It actually joins with the portal vein and uh, that is how the circulation, the fetal circulation continues. And after birth, there is no need for the umbilical vein. So, what happens is, it is usually degenerating and it is persisting as the ligamentum teres hepatis or the remnant of the umbilical vein is seen as the ligamentum teres hepatis or round ligament of liver. Coming to the next content, this is the vitello intestinal duct. This duct actually connects the midgut, this is the midgut region with the yolk sac. So, this connection is known as vitello intestinal duct and during late fetal period once the yolk sac is getting used up, this duct also will just degenerate. Sometimes this duct will persist uh, even after birth and that condition is known as Meckel's diverticulum. We have already seen that uh, there is a finger like projection at the caudal end of the embryonic disc that is known as the allantoic diverticulum. This is actually uh, for the vascularization of the umbilical cord that means the umbilical vessels are derived from the vessels of the allantoic diverticulum. So, in late fetal period once the fetal uh, blood vessels are developed in the late fetal period the allantoic diverticulum the remnant is seen as the uracus but after birth the same uracus will be forming the median umbilical ligament, there is only one uracus, so it will be seen as the median umbilical ligament after birth. So, median umbilical ligament actually extends between the urinary bladder, the apex of the urinary bladder to the anterior abdominal wall. Now, classification of placenta, so we have uh, till now discussed about the placenta, the structure of placenta, uh, we discussed about the umbilical cord, we discussed about the contents of the umbilical cord. Now, we are uh, going to discuss about the classification of placenta. So, the placenta uh, can present with different shapes and different sizes and all. So, how it is classified? The first classification is according to the shape. How are they classified? Usually, placenta is a disc, looks, looks like a disc. Sometimes, it will look like two discs. In that condition, you call it as bidiscoidal. And sometimes, it, is, uh, it uh, also looks like as if lobed with different lobes in it. So, it is also classified as lobed placenta. Another term which you should be familiar here is diffuse or placenta membrane ECA. What do you mean by diffuse or placenta membrane ECA? Here, uh, we have already discussed that during the initial period of development of placenta, the chorionic villi was covering all around the blastocyst and later in course of time, the region at which the proper placenta is forming that is known as chorion frondosum and the remaining is actually disappearing and uh, seen as chorion leaf. In this case what happens is this chorionic villi persist all round the placenta, so all around the blastocyst. So, when you look at it, when you look at the blastocyst or when you look at the fetus, you can see that the placenta is just like a thin sheet which is covering the entire fetus and you won't be getting a disc of placenta. That condition is known as placenta membrane ACA. Another term according to the shape is placenta succinturiata. What do you mean by placenta succinturiata? It is a small part of placenta is getting separated from the main part and uh, it is seen as an accessory loop. Okay, so, that is what is meant by placenta succinturiata. Now, uh, sometimes in the placenta when you have a look, uh, you will be seeing a hole in it. So, that condition is known as fenestrated placenta. And uh, 
another variety is known as circumvallate. Circumvallate means the peripheral edge of the placenta if you look you can see a sulcus and it will be covered by a circular fold of decidua. So, you just see a placenta and uh, towards the periphery you will be seeing a sulcus and that sulcus will be actually covered by a bit of decidua. So, that condition is known as circumvallate. So, this is the periphery of the placenta here you will be getting a sulcus and this will be actually uh, covered by a bit of decidua like a fold circular fold this is known as circumvallate placenta. Now, according to the position of insertion of the umbilical cord when you look at the placenta it differs. So, normally you know that uh, the position of the umbilical cord will be somewhat near the center of the placenta. If the umbilical cord is getting attached towards the margin of the placenta you call it as marginal or battle door placenta. What do you mean by furcate uh, attachment? Furcate attachment means the blood vessels divide before reaching the placenta. Usually what happens is uh, the blood vessels enter through the umbilical cord and when it reaches the placenta then it divides and enter the placenta. But here what happens is even before the umbilical cord uh, reaches the placenta the blood vessels will start dividing and that is how you get a furcate attachment that is the blood vessels divide before reaching the placenta. Another method or another pattern of attachment is velamentous. In this condition uh, you will be getting the blood vessels attached to the amnion first where they ramify before reaching the placenta. So, as the blood vessels go towards the placenta you have the amnion covering it. So, once they see the amnion they will be just branching in the amnion and then only they will be reaching the placenta. So, such condition is known as velamentous placenta. Now, um, we just discussed about the different shapes of the placenta, different types of attachment of the umbilical cord. Now, depending, depending upon the degree of penetration, depending upon the degree of penetration into the uterine wall, uh, you can consider different types of placenta like placenta accreta, placenta increta and placenta percreta. So, what do you mean by all these different varieties? Placenta accreta means it is adhered deep to the decidua basalis. So, in the endometrium if it is going deeper to the deeper aspects of the endometrium you call it as placenta accreta. What do you mean by increta? In this condition you will be getting uh, the placenta embedded into the myometrial wall and what do you mean by placenta percreta? In this condition it will be uh, penetrating the entire wall of the uterus up to the perimetrium. So, that is what is meant by uh, these three types of placenta according to the penetration into the uterine wall. So, placenta accreta, placenta increta and placenta percreta. Accreta means adhered deep to the decidua basalis, increta means reaching up to the myometrium and uh, placenta percreta means reaching up to the perimetrium. So, this is how it will look like. This is a normal mode of attachment. Accreta means it is lying deeper to the endometrium, increta it is reaching almost into the myometrium and uh, percreta means it is going beyond the myometrium into the perimetrium. So, accreta within the endometrium, increta within the myometrium and percreta reaching beyond the myometrium into the perimetrium. Now, at this context you should know what do you mean by a fetal membrane. So, fetal membrane actually consists of these components. So, you can see this is the decidua basalis, this is the decidua capsularis and the outer lining of the uterine cavity will be decidua parietalis. So, fetal membrane consists of the decidua parietalis, decidua capsularis, then you have the chorion leaf and you have the amnion. So, you can see that in course of development towards term you are not able to visualize these layers as different layers. So, all these layers will be getting fused that is the decidua parietalis of the endometrial wall 
decidua capsula is covering the fetus, then inner to it you have the chorion leaf, then you have the amnion. So, all these layers will be getting fused and that is how you get the amniochorionic membrane. So, the amniotic sac enlarges faster than the chorionic cavity and the amnion and chorionic leaf fuse together to form the amniochorionic membrane. So, in towards term you can see it as a single membrane and it is the rupture uh, of the amniochorionic membrane uh, after which you have the expulsion of the fetus. So, after the disappearance of the decidua capsularis, it adheres to the decidua parietalis and finally, you have the amniochorionic membrane rupturing during labor. So, in preterm uh, labor what happens is there is premature rupture of the amniotic membrane. Considering the normal site of implantation, it is the upper part of the uterus where you have the fundus and the greater part of the body that is considered as the upper segment of the uterus. It is to the upper segment of the uterus you have the normal implantation of placenta. And the lower part of the uterus is actually the lower part of the body, the cervix. So, altogether you call it as lower uterine segment. So, placenta normally attaches to the upper uterine segment. So, when you will you call it as abnormal implantation? If the implantation is happening anywhere other than the upper segment, you call it as abnormal implantation. So, it can be within the uterine cavity as well as outside the uterine cavity. Outside the uterine cavity, you call it as extra uterine pregnancy. So, it can be in the ovary you call it as primary ovarian pregnancy, it can be the abdominal cavity like the pouch of Douglas, the greater omentum uh, or it can be in the uterine tube, the tubal pregnancy and it is uh, accounting to about 95 percentage of the ectopic pregnancies. Now, all these are options of extra uterine pregnancy. Sometimes you might get abnormal implantation within the uterine cavity that is uh, when it is getting implanted within the uterine cavity other than the upper segment then again it is ectopic. So, that condition is when the uh, implantation happens in the lower part of the uterine cavity. So, that is actually an abnormal site of implantation and that condition is known as placenta previa. So, these are the different grades of placenta previa. So, there are mainly 4 grades of placenta previa. Grade 1 means the placenta lies in the lower uterine segment, but it is not reaching the internal os. Grade 2 means it is lying as close as the internal os. Grade 3 means it covers the internal os, but it would not be occluding the internal os. That is when the cervix is dilated, it would not be closing the internal os. But when you look at grade 4, you can see that the placenta is completely overlying the internal os and even when the cervix is getting dilated, uh, it would not be open because the placenta is just closing it like a lid. And one more uh, applied aspect which I would like to mention at this context is the formation of hydatidiform mole or molar pregnancy. Suppose a lady will be coming to you with uh, pregnancy test positive and when you look at her uterine cavity, you will be seeing many vesicles filled with fluid instead of a properly formed fetus. Such a condition is known as gestational trophoblastic disease because it is the trophoblast which is abnormal and that will be containing a non-viable fertilized egg. So, the trophoblast tissue is formed in the absence of female pronuclei, there will not be any contribution from the mother. So, in the absence of female pronuclei, you have the cells multiplying within the uterine cavity. So, uh, that means the paternal genes can regulate the development of trophoblast. Even if you will not get any genes from the mother, the paternal genes are sufficient enough to regulate the development of the trophoblast. So, there are uh, based on this, there are the mainly two types of mole. Uh, one is called a partial mole and the other one is called complete mole. So, what do you mean by a complete mole and a partial mole? So, if you just look at the complete mole, you can see that the ovum, the portion of ovum is empty and that is actually resulting in the formation of a homozygous and heterozygous complete mole. You have the contribution from the sperm. Uh, sometimes one sperm enters the empty ovum and then duplicate and uh, you get a set like this 
or sometimes you get two sperms fertilizing with an empty ovum and you get a heterozygous complete mole. Partial mole means there is contribution from the ovum and sometimes two sperms uh, along with this ovum forms a triploid state that is known as partial mole. So, these are the two different varieties of hydatidiform mole. One is complete mole and the other one is partial mole. One is having an empty ovum whereas the other one is having uh, an ovum but at the same time you, you will be getting two sperms fertilizing and it will be a triploid state. So, to summarize uh, we have discussed about the placenta, the umbilical cord, the formation of it, uh, the development of the chorionic villi, the different stages of chorionic villi, then um, the structure in detail, the function, then the placental barrier, how uh, it is becoming a term villus, then what are the variations of placenta depending upon the shape, uh, depending upon the attachment of the umbilical cord, depending upon the penetration, uh, then a little bit of applied aspects as well. So, that is all about uh, the topic placenta. Thank you.